All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 86, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And you probably can hear it by now, but I'm a bit under weather today with a tiny migraine. So if I'm a bit slow and, you know, not as fast as usual and not going through things as speedy as I should be, then, you know, just apologies in advance. Basically, yeah, the weather is a bit killing me over here. Uh, hey, not a number is a number. That's a great username. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Okay. So uh, luckily for me, I guess, we don't really have that many news and articles this time around, but we do have a ton of announcements and really major releases this week. So I guess let's just uh, get cracking. The first section, as usual, is getting started. And uh, we do have quite a bit over here. Uh, Some of those articles are really cool. The first one today is Framer Guide to React. This is a comprehensive guide for the designers, essentially from the Framer uh, people. The If you never heard about Framer, it's a tool for designers similar to Sketch or Figma that is built around React, essentially. And since their tool is built around React, you sort of, you know, you need to know React to use it to the full potential. So they wrote this guide to React for the designers who essentially don't know anything about software development, which is really cool. The guide itself is very nicely written, very easy to follow, and uh, includes basically everything you wanna know from theory to syntax to tooling, which is kind of awesome. I also wanna do a shout out to them for doing this. So if you, when you open the guide first time and you know you go through it and you go through the theory, you go to the syntax and then they, okay, they go like, okay, give us your email, right? This is something that happens on a lot of websites. Now, huge props to them for adding a button. No, thanks. I just want to read that thing. And I don't care about your, you know, news or whatever, which is freaking awesome. So framer people, thank you very much for doing that. This is great. Anyway, if you are learning react, if you're just getting started, this guide is pretty amazing. So highly recommend it. Continuing, we got uh, the purpose of JavaScript proxies. So this is a pretty basic introductory article to ES6 proxies. If you are just getting started with them, if you heard about them, but didn't know when to where to start and how exactly do they work, then this basically explains them quite briefly, to be honest, and showcases, you know, one uh, real world example, which is pretty basic as well. But it's a good starting point. So you know, if you're curious to check it out. Next thing we got here is building a typing game with Melon.js. A pretty comprehensive and very long, as you can see here by the scroll bar tutorial on building a typing game using Melon.js engine. The uh, sort of cool thing about Melon.js is that it's not like, um, I don't know, it's basically not a rendering thing, right? It's it's a full on game engine with integrated physics and sound API and basically everything you might want to have while building the game. So this is all in one tutorial that teaches you to build a complete game with a pretty full featured engine. And in this case, you know, it's a typing game. So it's uh, aims to teach you how to type properly, which is also a nice touch. Uh, so if, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a very well written and as I said, very detailed tutorial. So pretty good starting point. All right, continuing, we got React Hooks, oops, part three, an effect doesn't run again when its dependencies change. So this is the continued series, I think I already covered, like at least I remember covering the part two for sure. I think we talked about part one as well. So this part talks about um, the effect changes and refs specifically, right? So whenever the component updates, it will re-render and then use effect will rerun once the value dependency change, right? In this case, the dependency is ref. The thing is, if you remove the state from this component, component will no longer re-render, which means the ref and use effect will not be triggered even if the ref itself changes. So this is essentially the gist of the article. If you already knew that, you won't really find anything new here. If what I just said sounded confusing, then do look through the article. It's not very long, but it does explain what exactly happens in a very comprehensive manner. Next thing we got here is be aware of stale closures when using React hooks. Uh, This is again, talking about React hooks and closures specifically. I mean, JavaScript closures is one of those tricky topics that you absolutely have to know, but it takes, well, you know, months, if, if not years to understand it completely. 
And yeah, in React hooks, it becomes increasingly important because stale closures lead to weird behavior from React itself. So if you are not familiar with the term stale closures, if you are not comfortable with closures just yet, but you are using React and you encountered weird behaviors in your hooks, then this article is essentially for you. It does a very good job of explaining what the stale closures are, how do they relate to the React hooks, and how exactly do you evade having stale closures in your React components. Right, continuing, we got creating a lists progressive web app with React and Firebase. That's a pretty nice write up about essentially doing a notes app. So the list is just, you know, list of strings, essentially. Uh, with React and storing the data in Firebase, so using Firebase's backend, uh, nothing super fancy here, you know, React hooks, Firebase, NoSQL databases and stuff like this. Um, everything's pretty straightforward. Uh, hey, um, blah, let me try to read your username. Cure have, cure have no mana. Okay. <laughs> hey, cure have no mana. Welcome to the stream. The links can be found on the GitHub. The link is in the channel description. Just scroll down a bit and you can find everything that I'm covering over there. You can also go to bxjs.dev website and just uh, look them up over there. All right, continuing, we got, wait, you're not using strict mode. Uh, so this is the article about React strict modes, the addition that I think happened half a year ago or so. So it was like quite some time ago. It's essentially a mode for debugging your components and uncovering weird behaviors uh, in advance, essentially. And a lot of people are not using it and a lot of people not even aware of that. So if you've never heard about strict mode and you're just like going, you know, what is this? How does it work? Then this article is for you. If you already know what strict mode is, then you won't really find anything new here, but it's a good write up explaining what is strict mode, how to use it and when exactly should you be using it? Um, am I using strict mode? I've used it a couple of times. Like there was a couple of bugs that were really hard to catch with a normal mode that only happened in some cases. I tried enabling strict mode and caught them immediately. So in this case, it's, it's a very handy tool uh, because of purely because of the way that it works and, you know, renders the components multiple times and stuff like this. So it is a handy tool. You just need to know how it works and when to use it. But I wouldn't say, I basically wouldn't say that, you know, you need to use it every time. So it's, it's not mandatory. Although if you use it constantly in your developments, I guess you would catch a lot of bugs in a, like, you know, faster than you would typically with a normal mode. But it does make uh, writing components a bit harder because uh, again, you know, for example, it renders the components multiple times. So you have to think about that and use the memoization and all that kind of stuff to prevent them from doing stuff four or five times over, which is, yeah, is just um, sometimes not worth it basically. Let me put it this way. But anyway, a pretty great write up. So if you're interested in React strict mode, do check it out. Okay, and I think that's the last article we got here in a get started section, uh, the problems of shared mutable state and how to avoid them. So this is again, a very lengthy write up on a shared mutable state that talks about what is shared mutable state? Why is it problematic? And how exactly can you avoid those problems and address them in your code? So if you are just getting started with JavaScript and you never heard the shared mutable state, uh, expression and you don't know what that means, then you absolutely must read this because sooner or later you will encounter this problem and it's one, like it's a pain in ass essentially, right? Knowing how to tackle it is crucially important. If you already know what the shared state is and you already encountered the problems, you know how problematic it is, then well, use this as a guide. There is a ton of uh, hints here and tons of uh, really good pointers on showing how to work with it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of great. Do check it out. Uh, hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. All right, that is it for the getting started section. Now we're coming to the news and articles. And uh, the first one we got here today is befriending what you see is what you get editors text highlighting with virtual underlines. So this is um, a very specific article that is I, I honestly never thought I would actually read something like this. <laughs> Because it talks about, um, so this is from the uh, company, what was their name? I remember it was somewhere around here. I think it was at the very bottom. So they're doing like the text analytics, web spell checker, right? So spell checking, right? A very straightforward topic. And this article talks about how they integrated their spell checking into a variety of third party editors, right? So you got 
uh, things like, uh, where's the, where they had a list somewhere here. There you go, like CK Editor 4 or um, the React versions like the Frawl Editor, Tiny MCE, and then there was the React like Quill and Draft and Slate. And turns out that just highlighting the words in there, like, you know, this the highlight that happens when you misspell the word or there's some correction with regards to grammar, it's not as easy as you might think it is, right? It's just like, come on, it's just a highlight. How hard could that be? Well, it turns out it's actually really hard. <laughs> so um, if you're curious about what exactly happens when you have to highlight words in third-party editors and you have to suggest the fixes to it, right, with the plugins or whatever, do check it out. It's a pretty fascinating write-up on uh, the whole topic. It seems very straightforward in the beginning, but you mo the more you read, the more interesting it essentially becomes. Uh, hey, Shandy, welcome to the stream. All right, but yeah, so if that sounds interesting, uh, do check it out. It's a really good write-up, very cool to read. Uh, a lot of issues that I never thought would actually be an issue before I started reading that, but <laughs> it's fascinating. Okay, continuing, we got build FF and PEG WebAssembly version. This is part three. We talked about part one and part two. Um, I think a couple of episodes ago was the part two, and then like about a month ago, we had part one. So this one is talking about using FFmpeg.js, the compiled version within your Node.js or JavaScript environment to actually transcode your file. I think this specifically talks about Node.js because it uses the FS API to read the files. Um, so yes, it is uh, kind of crazy, but yes, you actually can, um, again, you know, you can compile FFmpeg to WebAssembly and then you can just use the WebAssembly version within Node.js to just convert your transcode, your uh, video from one format to another, in this case from AV to MP4, which is um, kind of crazy. So if you followed the first two articles, then definitely check this one out that basically explains in details how do you wrap it into Node.js module and then how do you use it in an easy manner within Node.js. If you haven't heard about this series of articles, you can as well read the first two parts. Uh, they basically guide you through building your own FFmpeg in WebAssembly. Those were pretty good as far as I remember at least, so uh, do check it out. Okay, next thing, uh, we got two announcements from the React team. So there's the React conf going on right now, if you haven't heard about that. And they made a bunch of major announcements. The first one being preparing for the future with React pre-releases. The gist of it is that React is no longer going to be coming out in uh, stable plus release candidates versions. Um, it now will have a bunch of release versions. So we're going to have the latest channel. So this is going to be the stable channel where we're going to get the latest stable version, basically what you have today. And this is what everyone should use for the production applications. We're going to have a next track, which is going to be a pre-releases that are going to be served uh, directly basically from, or, you know, almost directly from, I think, yeah, it basically tracks the master branch. So it's going to be the master branch builds, which is the release candidates essentially with potentially with breaking changes and with uh, bugs and stuff uh, for the next minor server. So keep that in mind. And then there's going to be experimental track, which is going to include experimental API releases and features that are not yet available in stable releases and that can potentially break a lot of things. So, you know, you have to keep that in mind. The cool thing is that basically this is already uh, out there. You can already try it, uh, all of those releases using Semver tags. So it's very easy to switch between them if you want to try new experimental features, for example. And uh, yeah, uh, the first of the experimental releases is the concurrent mode, something that uh, React team was talking about for two years now, I think. I think the first announcement Dan did was like two years ago on React Conf again. So the concurrent mode includes suspense for data fetching. There's, uh, and then there's like basically concurrent UI patterns and a bunch of other guides that they have here for working with it. I think I'm mostly excited about the suspense for data fetching, which is a really cool feature. Again, show, showcased, I think, two years ago or something like that. And we'll finally have it here in the experimental build. So you can actually take it and try it out today. So if you are, if you know what the suspense for data fetching is, if you know what the concurrent uh, mode is, definitely check it out. Definitely try it out. It's very easy. They even have the code sandbox links somewhere here where you can just, you know, play around with it. There we go. Um, it's uh, pretty damn good. So uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting to see that. I'm not sure how soon it will 
ship in the stable version, but nonetheless, it's really exciting to see that. Um, again, if you know, if you want more details, do check out the article. All right. That's actually it for the articles and news, as I said, not that many of them today. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first thing we got here today is a tip from Ingvar Stepanian. Uh, the, today I learned that you can give custom names to web workers for easier debugging. Turns out when you create a new worker thread, uh, web worker thread in the browser, you can pass an options object that has a name parameter that will name the given worker, right? And then when you log the, uh, when the worker logs something or when you inspect the worker in your threads layout and dev tools, you will actually have the proper name that you gave it, which is super handy. So if you work a lot with the web workers, do make sure to keep that in mind. Another tip is that also worker can assign the name to itself by using self.name if you don't want to set it while creating worker, which is also quite handy. So yeah, pretty nice trick, I think. And it's also in spec, so it's not a DevTools feature, it's actually a standard, which is also kind of great. Right, continuing, we got a new update, I guess, to the actions setup node in GitHub Actions. So if you're using GitHub Actions, uh, setup node will now automatically annotate ESLint failures right on your code. So if you have a GitHub Action that runs on the pull request or in your push or you know whatever, if the linting fails, it will actually annotate your uh, failures right on your code within the pull request, for example, itself. So you can actually see it in line, which is super damn handy. So that's pretty exciting to see how the GitHub Actions evolve. Right, next thing we got here is introducing progressive web apps to Samsung Galaxy Store. Um, this is so, it's honestly something I did not expect to see, but really awesome to see. So Samsung just uh, added indexing for progressive web apps right into their um, Samsung Galaxy App Store, right? So they have their own version of Google App Store, uh, sorry, Google Play Store, uh, which is called Samsung Galaxy Store that includes the Android apps. And now they're going to have the web apps there under a specific uh, section of web apps and you can be able to install it from the store itself, which means more um, discoverability for the web apps. Unfortunately, the, like the only downside for this right now is that to submit the app there, you have to like manually email them uh, for PVA support at samsung.com, which, you know, obviously this could be improved, but it's a really cool first step. So uh, pretty exciting to see that. Um, it's a bit sad to see that Apple is basically the only one who are neglecting the whole progressive app, app ecosystem and their progressive app, app support is still like, you know, in, in a very bad state and the browser diversity on iOS devices is also very sad, but uh, there we go. That's really cool. Okay. And the last thing we got here today is a super neat trick from Mr. Vesboss. Um, so since arrays are objects, you can destructure their indexes to easily grab first and last items. It looks like this, right? So the idea is that you can destructure array as an object. And then you can get a length property and then you can get a zero index as the first and then you can use this length property that was deconstructed as length minus one to get the last item and this will get you the first the last items of an array, which is something that obviously, you know, is very obvious once you see that, but I haven't even thought about that before, which is like, this is a really cool trick. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, um, this is it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we're coming to the releases section, and oh boy, do we have some releases this week around. The first thing here is Node.js version 12.13, so this makes uh, turns Node.js 12 into LTS version, so long-term support. So if you are sticking to LTS versions, now you can safely update from the version 10 to version 12 without any problems. Um, this also brings the NPM to version 6.12 and no JIP now supports Python 3, which is kind of great. Um, yeah, is basically Node 12 is now LTS, so you should use that, drop everything else older that you're using and um, it's gonna, yeah, remain active LTS until October 2020 and then two more years and maintenance modes. And as we've seen, maintenance mode typically means a lot of updates, to be honest. So there you go. Along with a Node.js uh, 12 going into LTS, we got Node.js 13 release and, and a bunch of minor patches that fixed the bugs already. Uh, the notable change to this is that the V8 is now updated to version 7.8, which is the same as the Chrome uses. So it is now 
aligned with the current version, current release of the V8, which is mind blowing. We finally at a state where Node.js releases together, almost together. I think it was, they released the 13 like a couple of days after the V8 7.8 was released, which is insane when you think about that. But it's really cool to see. Like there's a bunch of obviously other changes within the Node core. So if you're interested, do read the notable changes. But yeah, as I said, you know, the, the biggest thing is uh, V8 being on the current version immediately, which is just crazy. All right. Uh, obviously, since, you know, we got V8 7.8, we got Chrome 78, uh, which, well, most of the normal changes are a bit boring. The cool thing is they've started the new origin trials. Uh, there's two of them. They are behind the flags. The first one is the native file system access. So you can actually try that and uh, access complete file system from the browser, which is uh, really great. And then there's the SMS receiver trial, which obviously works only on the phones, uh, for example, useful for verifying phone numbers using SMS. But uh, yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, I'm not as excited about SMS receiver as I am about the native file system access. So there we go. We'll see how that develops. Next major release we got here is Firefox version 70, a really big one as well, with a bunch of, you know, not so notable releases, uh, not so notable changes, like the one that I found interesting was this, uh, it now includes options for styling underlines, which is not the thing I ever thought I would need, but it actually looks really cool. So it essentially allows you to um, change the style of the underlining lines, you know, including thickness, offset and colors and everything. And it looks insane. Like, I'm not sure why is that wasn't the thing in original spec, but it actually looks very useful. Um, and then there's, yeah, numeric separators finally made it to Firefox. Uh, there's a bunch of Intel improvements and uh, DevTools changes. This is my favorite part. So first of all, it now shows the inactive CSS rules. Not only that, it also shows you why they are inactive. So you can actually change that to make them active or completely remove them if you know they are no longer useful, which is pretty amazing. And I wish, uh, for, um, sorry, Chrome DevTools would do the same. And then we got a uh, pause and DOM mutation in debugger, which is also super handy. So this could help you debug some things quite a bit. And you also have like some accessibility stuff and the WebSocket inspector that we were talking about last time is now landed in a stable branch as well. So you can just uh, go ahead and use it. All right. Next release we got here is Ghost version 3.0. So this is a major release for the Ghost. If you never heard about Ghost, it's a JavaScript based uh, CMS uh, that is used for like blogging and website creation essentially. And um, they went ahead and changed the whole underlying architecture of Ghost. So it used to be the sort of dynamic CMS, which had a dynamic front end that was generated from the database. And then they have like the admin panel that basically changes the database and that's it, right? So they reworked it. The new version is essentially generating a static website with dynamic features like, you know, small dynamic elements or the admin panel that actually generates the data. So it's closer to the Gatsby now than ever before, I guess, just with integrated admin panel and no need to, you know, manually edit the uh, data, which I guess is actually sounds pretty good to be honest. So if you're curious, do check it out. It's actually extremely easy to self host. It literally takes like one Docker container to spin this thing up. Uh, they obviously offer the Ghost Pro, which is, you know, their hosted version, paid version. It's actually very expensive. I would actually offer like, I mean, you're, you know, the guys you're watching me, so you're a developers. So it's a lot easier to just self host and a lot cheaper. <laughs> but nonetheless, the Ghost itself is a really cool thing. So do check it out if you never heard about that. Okay, next release we got here is Electron version 7.0. Um, yeah, it's basically upgrades the Chromium to 78 and V8 to 78 for the latest releases. Uh, Node.js is still 12.8, which is uh, not even the LTS yet. So they're like lagging quite a few versions behind in Node versions, but uh, nonetheless, really cool to see those changes. There is some breaking changes uh, aside from, you know, the migration to newer Node and uh, Chromium. So if you are upgrading your Electron app, make sure to read through those because there are some API deprecations that might break your stuff. All right. Um, and I think the last release we got here for today is Puppeteer version 2.0 that upgrades to Chromium 79, which is, uh, you know, this is the bleeding edge Chromium basically. 
uh, requires Node.js version 8 or higher, version 6 support is dropped uh, and adds new API for emulating time zone, media types, media and media features. So you can, for example, now, oh, sorry, the media type is now supersede the old media thing. So you can now basically emulate dark mode and stuff like this and media queries if you want to simulate the phone devices or whatever, you know, which could be quite handy for testing actually. All right, that is it for the releases section. Now we got some libraries and demos. The first one today is the type root, a type safe routing library for uh, front end. I honestly don't know why I would want type safety in my routers, but maybe you do, so do check it out. Keep in mind, this is a beta release, so there might be some problems. Uh, so yes, just you know, keep that in mind. Essentially, if you want a type safe router for whatever reason, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is SQL to Mongo, use SQL to query MongoDB. This is a tiny utility that takes in an SQL query and rewrites it to the Mongo query object, which could be handy for migrations, I guess, but I would not use that in production because I imagine that some of those queries would be, um, you know, not as performant as queries you could write yourself to the Mongo with optimizations in mind, essentially. So uh, there you go. Nonetheless, pretty neat. Uh, Utility and I guess could be useful in quite some cases. Next thing we got here is Lando, a local development and DevOps tool for all your projects that is easy, fast, powerful, and liberating, as it says. Essentially, it's a higher level wrapper around Docker Compose that relies on Docker and Docker Compose and just does a bunch of work for you. So it can scaffold uh, things like Drupal, Joomla, Mean, Lamp, whatever, WordPress, all of that using Docker Compose and just handles everything for you by, you know, automating some things. Uh, I mean, I guess it could be handy. I personally don't like Compose that much. I prefer setting up things separately because up upgrading Compose services is a bit of a pain in ass, but yeah, maybe you use Compose heavily, so this might be a thing for you to check it out. Next thing we got here is Seal build container images for your Node.js applications. So this is a tool uh, that builds around the uh, Docker and essentially just automates the Docker file generation for your Node.js apps. Uh, very straightforward. The only thing it does is literally generates the Docker compo uh, sorry, Docker file and then builds the Docker image for you. Um, doesn't seem to do anything else. If you want to deploy your files, look into Exaframe, wink, wink, not nudge. Uh, this is a tool that I've written and um, it does quite a bit more. But uh, if you just want to build Docker files and Docker images, then do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. All right, continuing, we got JS Fuzz, uh, coverage guided fuzz testing for JavaScript. So uh, if you never heard about fuzz testing, the idea is that you basically call your packages during testing with a wide variety of random parameters to make sure that they correctly fail when they get unexpected inputs, right? So what this tool does is exactly that, but it also follows. Uh, so it basically not just randomly does it as majority of the fast testers do it, but it actually follows the test coverage to ensure that every possible line is triggered at least once. So you get the 100% test coverage, which sounds pretty nice. So if you are interested in that, do check it out. All right. Next thing we got here is Tina CMS. Uh, so it's a site editing toolkit for modern React based websites like Gatsby and Next.js. What that means is it's a content management system that can be integrated in your Gatsby or Next.js website, which is actually sounds really cool. Why is my GIF not playing? I have no idea because my JavaScript is blocked. There we go. So what it does is it basically comes in as a plugin for uh, Gatsby or, you know, a, a plugin for Next.js, which adds this real-time editing capabilities where you can just edit your website live on in your browser instead of modifying your sources, right? And this will actually propagate the changes back to the source and update the original files, be it Markdown or whatever you use, which actually looks pretty damn cool. So if you're working with Gatsby, if you're working with Next.js and you wanted to have live editing features, do check it out. This actually looks incredibly impressive. Right, continuing, we got CampKits, uh, build serverless Node.js microservices fast. Yet another toolkit for the serverless microservices uh, using Node.js. 
This one is based on classes and decorators. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a fan of either and I am not completely sold on serverless paradigm. So if you are working with serverless, if you was looking for um, microservices using serverless and you are a fan of object-oriented programming, do check it out. Maybe this is what you wanted. All right. Continuing, we got Peaks.js from BBC, uh, which is, uh, you know, impressive on its own. So it's a JavaScript UI component for interacting with audio waveforms. The way it works is basically you have some sort of a backend that sends the waveforms to the client, and then this library renders the waveform and allows you to interact with it. So it's not, it doesn't process the audio in itself, it actually expects the waveform from you was made uh, by the BBC R&D team and uh, essentially used internally, I guess, at their website. It looks pretty impressive. Like it has a ton of uh, different features and uh, you can do a lot of um, pretty neat things with it uh, with regards to editing audio in the browser. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Popper.js, a keycast library for managing your poppers. Uh, so essentially poppers in this case means the pop-ups, pop-overs, tooltips, whatever is popping over on top, on right, wherever. This thing essentially wraps around that and allows you to uh, flexibly modify that, including with scrolls and stuff. It is quite old. It is very established. And, you know, I, I thought since I haven't covered it, why not? It's pretty popular, 13K stars. So there you go. I just wanted to highlight it and to add it to the BXJS uh, weekly library, essentially, you know. <laughs> but yes, you probably heard about it. It is very old and um, nonetheless, you know, it looks pretty nice. So if you're working with the pop-ups, pop-overs and so on, do check it out. And it works with React, Vue, Angular, whatever and so on. So yes, it's, it's pretty universal. Right, continuing, we got Totalist, a tiny a utility to recursively list all files in a directory. So if you're working with the files in the Node.js and you wanted to get a list of all files in a folder, which, you know, it's, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass to do it manually because you have to like get the things, check if it's a folder or file. If it's a folder, go get the list and then continue again and again and again until you list all the files, which, I mean, it's not super hard to do. It's just annoying, right? But this basically does it for you. You just give it a blob to traverse and then you can either filter something or uh, work with it. And you get a list of all files with their path in uh, as a result. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's that's all it does. So there you go. Next thing we got here is logux or log logux or log UX. I'm not even sure how to read that. It's um, Replacement for Ajax and REST by uh, Redux action synchronization between client and server. So I guess this will be only useful to people who are working with Redux. And uh, what it does is basically sets up a server and uh, syncs the Redux state between the server and client seamlessly. So you essentially as a developer don't even have to think about that, which actually sounds really cool. Uh, but again, only works if you are using Redux and it does need a server, obviously. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is a subfont, a command line tool to optimize your web font loading, uh, aggressive subsetting based on your font use, uh, self-hosting or Google fonts and preloading. So if you're working a lot with web fonts and you wanna optimize them aggressively and minimize the sizes you use and so on and so forth, then do check it out. It seems to be a very simple um, command line tool that uses Broadly, Zopfly and whatever you can imagine basically to make um, the most optimal fonts you can ever imagine. Um, I guess, yeah, that's basically all it does. So there you go. All right. And the last library we got here for today is non-synchronous. It's um, a sync await callback fusioning utilities. It's just a bunch of tiny utils for working with um, promisified functions or promisifying functions in this case. So there's stuff like promisify once, when, whenify, uh, whenify methods, promisify methods, immediate timeouts, and you know all these tiny utilities that you usually end up writing yourself when working with promises. So if you are working with promises a lot and you are tired of writing your own tiny utils, then do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. 
Right, that's it for the libs and demos. Now we got a couple of interesting things here to, to close this off. The first one being this scientific paper on um, WebAssembly, it's titled New Kid on the Web, a study of the prevalence uh, of the WebAssembly in the vials. Um, so again, you know, this is a scientific paper, so caveat supply, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite well written, but if you are not used to reading scientific papers, you're gonna have a hard time. I'm just going to read the uh, key takeaways from here, which is quite impressive. So they analyzed the Alexa top 1 million websites and found that one in 600 already uses WebAssembly, which is kind of mind blowing. Now, the problem with that is that over 50% of all websites that use WebAssembly actually applied for malicious deeds, <laughs> which makes me sad. Uh, if you're curious about the more in detail, like uh, in-depth analysis and everything, there's plenty of that in the article. So make sure to read that. There's like a variety of, you know, categories for what the WebAssembly is used for. Uh, malicious being the biggest one, as you might imagine. Um, gaming is actually like almost 30%, which is quite uh, interesting as well. But yeah, it's it's fascinating study. Uh, if you're curious, do check it out. I would say definitely worth reading through, even though it might put you off since it's a scientific language and it can be hard to digest, but there is a lot of very interesting info in here. All right, and the last thing here we have, uh, let me try that again. Last thing we have here for today is freefor.dev. It's a really nice collection of services, uh, software, software as a service, platform as a service, whatever else for developers uh, that are free for developers who are doing the open source work or sometimes even closed source work. So if you're looking for uh, cloud providers, analytics, APIs, machine learning, artifacting, uh, BAS, whatever that, what is BAS? Oh, backend as a service, okay. Backend as a service, content delivery network search, do check it out, there's an incredibly large list of things you can use for free, obviously some limits apply, but it's a really handy list. So, you know, there's even free hosting here, like Netlify and stuff, you know, this is pretty great. Even, f wait, there's free DNS. Okay, there's free DNS. I, apparently there's even free DNS right now. So uh, there you go. And it's obviously hosted on GitHub, so you can contribute your own links if you have any. And uh, yeah, it's, you know what, I should start it. Right, that is um, actually it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 86. If you guys have any questions or suggestions or you think I missed something, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap this up here. Uh, meanwhile, I will, while you're thinking about your questions and suggestions, I will tell you that you can find all the links that I mentioned on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. If you're watching on Twitch, the link is in the description of the channel. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, the links are in um, video description. Uh, we also have a Discord server where we talk about JavaScript and video games. Uh, we also There's also a Telegram channel where you can read all the links that I collect over the week. And, you know, quite a lot of them don't make it to the podcast. So if you're curious about all the garbage I collect, basically look there. Uh, I have a Twitter where I post about JavaScript video games and a bunch of other stuff. And that's basically it. Um, let me have a look at the chat. What is a backend as a service? Uh, backend as a service is essentially a pre-baked backend for you. So you don't have to build your own authentication, REST API and whatever. It's all in one already. You just configure it a bit and then start using in your front-end app. It's, yeah, it's, it can be quite like Firebase is a backend as a service. It's can be quite handy in some cases, but it also has its own limitations because it's built for to fit as many use cases as possible. So it's not, it might not be flexible enough for some very specific things, let's put it this way. Uh, not a number, uh, God damn, why is your username has to be so long? Not a number is a number. Thank you very much for your uh, kind feedback. Highly appreciate it. Very cool to hear that. Okay. Um, that's basically it from my side. Doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your support and feedback as usual. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you missed it, the VOD will be available on Twitch uh, immediately and uh, you can watch the VOD on YouTube in a couple of hours. Uh, thank you, not a number. I mean, I'm already better actually about after talking for half an hour uh, mystically, but, <laughs> but thanks, man. All right. Thank you guys very much for watching. Enjoy your weekend or the rest of the week. And I see you next time.
Bye.